Um, I'm sure you've also heard that um, Reverend No has resigned, and it's really no news at this point. But this is a message that I gave last week uh, at the, at Meet Our Church, and um, I, I wanted to share this with you as well because I think it's uh, it's, it's relevant to us. It's not only for Meet Our, but Reverend No, I'll, I'll be honest with you, we we never really connected. He's kind of doing his own thing, and I was doing my own thing, and we liked each other, and I, I'm pretty sure he liked me, and we had a couple of lunches, and we had this one commonality other than Jesus, and that was pho, pho 88, and uh, that's what we did. Um, but I, I grew to really respect him and like him because he, he was really hands-off, and that's what I appreciated about him. And you're like, that's not hard to do. Yes, it is. It's really hard to do, especially uh, KM pastors and KM EM ministry. There's a lot of, like, I wish Bridgeway would do this or our EM would do this, all that. But he just always behind the scenes supporting. If, if something goes wrong, he doesn't, he doesn't say, knock on my office door and say, you know, can you fix this, fix that? No, just like let them do their thing. Um, just before COVID, maybe six months before COVID, uh, I got a call from one of the Mira uh, uh, deacons and said, can we have lunch? And I would like to invite you and Mian and, and Reverend No and his wife and let's have lunch together. So we went and I knew what the meeting was about beforehand. And that was, uh, he wanted to give, his family wanted to give a, a large donation, a very large uh, donation for any, any initiative that we are thinking of doing or we want to do, but we couldn't do because we didn't have money to do it, the finance to do it. So I was like, yes. So I went there. And we talked, we had sushi. Yes, the sushi kept flowing and just coming out. I'm like, okay, it's gonna break, it's gonna drop the bomb. And, and he did, and I said, you know, what, what, you, what would you like to do? And I said, after school program. And bam, here's 20 grand. Like right there in cold hard check, <laughs> not cash. Uh, and, and Reverend No said, with a full smile, he's like, you take it. You take it, Bridgeway, you guys take it, and you guys do whatever you want to do with it. And, and Mirai will just support. If you need us to do something, we, we'll do it, but we just entrust it to you, and, and, and the donor said, we will give this amount every year. I mean, not like forever until Jesus comes, but you know, like, in a foreseeable, indefinite future, okay? All right. So, all that money is like, you take it. And I said to myself, oh, this is a good arrangement. I like this guy. I wish, uh, and that's when I realized uh, he, he doesn't have greed or desire for fame, make name for himself. And I said, oh, I, I wish he would stick around. I, I, I think I can do, I, I think I can really do ministry with him. Not that I felt any other way, but it's that moment I felt like, yes. We, we have a good partnership and trust here. Uh, but when I heard that he's leaving, I felt, who's going to come next? Because I've seen leadership changes in Korean immigrant churches, and I'm sure different immigrant churches as well. When the leadership changes, there's a, there's a conflict, there's difference in visions and ideas, and they serve different Jesus maybe, and, and they split. And I've seen splits. I've seen big mega churches split. I've seen small churches split. I've seen the whole range of just churches splitting. And if they haven't split yet, I get calls saying, I'm thinking of splitting or I hate KM or whatever. So I, I have this kind of like, okay, uh, what's, what's going to happen now? I, I wish we would get somebody good. And of course, we had, um, uh, during this process, we were looking for children's pastor and we're getting all these applicants. And you know, I'm thinking, okay, I, I wish we can get somebody good, and we did, yay. And um, it just thinking, you know, I wish somebody good would come in because that's what's really, you know, what is, that's really needed. At the leadership level, if you have good, God-fearing people, things kind of work out. Even when things are tough, things work out. And one of the things that Bridgeway is blessed with is good people. But it is this text that got me to think otherwise. It is this text um, you know, I, I have a lot of time to, for myself, for Netflix and Jesus. So, you know, this I, I was meditating and praying, and this text is really what God gave me to say, John, you need to cool down, and, and that, that's not the way, way the ministry or life works. You think 
good result is what makes life good. Good fruit. Bearing good fruit. Having good outcome with good people. Lots of smiles and, and lots of success in ministry. You think that's what I want and that's how I operate, but not so. And this text really just kind of drove a wedge into my heart and said, uh, John, wake up. That's not following Jesus. Doing good ministries and doing, having good outcomes is not, follow, it's not the same thing as following Jesus. So then what, what, what is following Jesus? Working with bad people and having like no outcome and terrible result and no result and things falling apart? No, I'm not saying that either. But let's get into this text and see what it means to follow Jesus rather than just living our life looking for good results looking for good people to have good times with. And whether that's your kids, your teachers, your, your spouse, your pastor, whatever the case might be, okay? So in this story, the background, uh, Graham just explained that so well. Uh, Jesus is looking for his disciples, the 12. He had multitude, and he had disciples. So he didn't just have a crowd, but he had, he had like kind of a core group of people. And from that, he's selecting the 12. And Jesus didn't say, uh, I'm just going to select 12, but he prays, if you look at the text, he prays all night. He prays the entire night before he chose the 12. And you have to ask yourself, what was the prayer? What was Jesus praying about? Dear God, I'm going to choose 12 people. Give me good preachers, guys who can teach, guys who can preach. Uh, guys who will follow me to the end, faithful people, um, smart people, good organizers, you know, just like one of each from every category, good marketer, you know, or just really hospitable, caring type, a really logical type, and a good preacher, and people who will stay with me to the end, because, you know, you see that in, in cults, right? People actually give their life, they whether that's deliberate suicide or uh, you know, whatever the case might be, they sell their home, they sell everything, they even kill their children. You know, Jesus could have prayed for something like that all night. Give me someone who will not backstab me. Who will, will you, give me people, 12 people that will give me good results for your glory. I mean, how can you argue against something like that? Give me people who will bear good fruit, many, many mucho fruit. Give me those people. Was that his prayer? And of course, Bible has no answer to my question. And we shouldn't think that um, I know the answer. But I have a hunch that I want to share with you. How did Jesus pray? What was his prayer? And for me, the answer comes from uh, another part of Luke, Luke chapter 4. Uh, and that is the temptation of Christ, right? And the temptation, as you know, there were three temptations, and the last temptation was this. Jesus, let's go up in a very high place in the temple, and you jump off because you're the Son of God. Your feet will not strike, strike the ground. As you jump off to a bungee cord diving without the bungee cord, angels will come, and they will swoop you up, and they will protect you. God loves you. God will not bring negative results in your life. God will not bring negative experience in your life. God will not. If you get hurt, that's not your God. And if you get, if you get hurt, you're not his son. God loves you. You will have good results at all costs. Every single time, even if you're dumb enough to jump off a building, he will protect you. And Jesus says, you shall not tempt the Lord. You shall not test the Lord. And the temptation ceases. But here's verse 12. This is important, guys. And Jesus answered him. It said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, so I'm guessing the three is just most representative, but maybe there were more. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from Jesus until an opportune time. Okay? In some translations, it says he temporarily departed from Jesus until an opportune time. But the funny thing is, you never see Satan make an entrance again 
in any part of Luke. This is it. So did, was Satan busy? Or was Satan like, this Jesus is good, man. I'm not going to tempt Peter and stuff and Judas. That's, that's good enough for me. It says, no, it, it, didn't, it didn't come until an opportune time. His exit was temporary and he was looking for an opportune time. So when is an opportune time? Is when Jesus is selecting his disciples and the same temptation is there. Will I choose people so that my life has good results and there are no negative outcomes? If you look at the list of the 12, Luke saves Judas Iscariot to the end, doesn't he? Judas Iscariot. Who becomes a betrayer? What is wrong with Jesus' prayer? Did he pray wrong? Or did he pray not long enough? Why is the prayer... I, I mean, all night is pretty good. I mean, I haven't prayed all night ever. Maybe like just, you know what I mean? And, and, and the result of his prayer is like backstabber. So does God, maybe God doesn't listen to prayer. Maybe Jesus did it in the wrong way, not long enough. What is, what is the deal? I think Jesus' prayer was not kind of prayer that we think it was, or at least I thought it was. I think Jesus was praying that he will not skirt away from negative outcomes of his life. That he surrounds himself with good people. That he surrounds himself with people that will just stick right to the end. That's the only people that he will select. But he chose people regardless of the outcome and knowing that there will be some betrayal. But he chose them. And he chose them by praying all night, saying maybe and this is my imagination, folks. Help me to love Judas to the end. Help me to be faithful to Judas, knowing that he is going to betray me. Change him, God. Let him see the light and let him know who you are, that he may walk into the light. I pray for him. Help me not to skirt away from the eventual crucifixion that is to come. Nurture him, God, as I choose Judas as into the inner circle. We all want good people. Do you want someone who will backstab you in your office? Like when you go to work, like, Jesus, give me the most abrasive, racist, ever, like, you know, sexist guy or girl ever into my life? You know, give me the laziest, you know, densest person ever, and just, we want our kids to be good. So we parent them in a certain way. We want our parents to be good, so we rebel in a certain way. Right? And then we want our friends to be a certain way, and we want our pastors and, and friends and family members and spouse to be a certain way. And when the results are not good, what are your solutions? And what are your prayers? Let me, bef yeah, let me, I, I'm trying not to get into application. Following Jesus is not asking God to guarantee good results. Following Jesus is to be like Jesus. Knowing that, first, no, first knowing that, that maybe you and I were chosen not because we're so good. We're like Judas, guys. You would disagree with me, I know, but let me convince you. I think Judas wanted a good outcome. And when Jesus didn't turn out to be that good outcome, the Messiah, the political military uh, Messiah, he cut his loss, and he betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. None of us will walk away from a church, and none of us will, like, you know, sell the bridgeway out, and none of us will sell Jesus out and, and walk away. That's not the temptation. But the temptation is, we say, I want good results. I want something good, and if you don't give that to me, I'm going to flounder. I'm going to walk away. And, and to that extent, we're like, too. 
the heart is there, tendencies there, the character is there for us to say, I want good things alone in my life. And they're all holy and righteous things. And if you don't give it to me, I don't know. I don't know what I will do. We all have that temptation. But the thing is, you and I have to know, that even though we have Judas-like tendencies, he has prayed and he has selected all of us. He has selected you. You're not here because we are right next to the highway. You're here because Jesus prayed, and knowing your tendencies, he has chosen you. Despite your mistakes, despite my mistakes, Jesus has chosen us, not by accident. And he has decided to pay a great cost because he loved us. We, we don't want our feet ever to strike the ground as we live with God and as we live this life. And that, brothers and sisters, is diverging from the path of Christ. The path of Christ is that he loved us, that he chose the weak, that he has decided to love those who will betray him. He, he is loving those who will fail. And how can we as Christians then live our life knowing that this is the Lord that we follow, that this is what Jesus is doing for us today. First of all, um, I don't want to, I, I mean, I don't want you to be discouraged if you find yourself in this way. We're chosen not because we're good. We're chosen because simply we're, Jesus loved us, that he's gracious to us. Uh, during my vacation, I, I attended two additional funerals. And um, one of the funerals was uh, Reverend Park. Reverend Park was a uh, retired pastor, Pastor Emer Emeritus, um, at uh, Light Korean Presbyterian Church, or Light Presbyterian Church now. And um, he, he's, he's a bit of a legend, guys. Uh, I don't want to get into too much of him, but into his biography. But when I was in school in elementary in Korea, I used to sing his songs that he wrote. And if you look in Korean hymnals, there are like, I think four of the songs are in there. His song was part of my school curriculum. And during Japanese occupation of Korea, Korean children were singing Japanese military march songs. Okay, go destroy, conquer, you know, show how great Japan, our empire is, and expand all that stuff. And he wrote like 150 children's songs so that Korean kids would grow up with Normal songs, talking about flowers and the hills and like having fun in the meadow rather than marching into another nation. He single-handedly changed the culture of, of children and, and their, their mindset. And he, I, I was lucky enough to serve alongside of him. And he passed away. And um, I, I felt terrible about that because... I, I was I didn't I didn't get to really talk to him after I left and I came to Bridgeway, so I I visited um, his wife, and we talked and we laughed and we talked about his um, past stories and exchanged the things that he said and he did. And um, Mrs. Park, she she said this to me. Pastor John, she's ninety when she's talking to Pastor John. Like Pastor John, now that I'm old, I get to look back and reflect upon my life, what went wrong, and how immature I was. I had many difficulties in my life, and, and by that she means difficult people, especially Korean ministry back in the day, and I know the stories, crazy, crazy stories. Please call me so I can tell you about them. And she said, I had, I had so many hurdles and so many hills and uphill battles. And every time I, I ran into those moments, I blamed God. And, and I, I was bitter towards him. And I asked him why. I didn't want to be a pastor's wife. My husband is a musician. Why is he in ministry? Why are we in this? Why, why did this happen to us? 
And then, now that I am older, said, God said this to me one day I was, I was praying. And he said, every time you had difficulties, you blame me, right? And you complain, and you're bitter. But it is then that I try to give you something. All those difficulties and hurdles are the moments where I will try to give you something. And she said, now that I'm older, I have so many things to repent. But I like that. Because it's an affirmation of what she has received from God. Then it was trial and difficulties. Then it was her feet striking the stones. But she says, now I know it was a gift from God, and I repent for all the times that I complained and I blamed him. But she's saying, I love it. How can we expect our Christian walk to be just rosy garden, rosy path? When our loving Savior walked the path of thorns. I remember telling you about the story of um, a village selecting a shepherd in Azerbaijan, and, and they have three applicants. Remember that story? There are three applicants, and, and one had 10 years' experience, the other one had 20, the other one had, was most elderly, and he had 30 years of experience. And one guy was kind of young, and he's kind of like, you know, brawn, and he's, he's ready to go, and there's an older one. And, um, you know, how, the question was posed to me was, uh, how, how, do you, how do you think they chose the shepherd? What is the qualifications? How do you choose a shepherd out of these three? Because the village needs a shepherd to herd the entire village, the flock of the entire village. And, and, and the criteria was, the qualification was this. They asked the village people, uh, people in the village asked uh, them to take off their shirt. So they all took off their shirt. And the ones that had the most scar, he got the job. And I think one of them didn't have a scar. And, and the logic is this. How can you not have scars when you're a shepherd? You're protecting your flock from wild animals. And you're getting to crevices and places where they go and you need to get them out. How can you be a shepherd with no scars? Were you really watching them? Or were you just a hireling? How can we not have any scars as we live our life when those scars represent something good that Jesus has given to us? And what is the good that he has given to us? Loving our enemies. Having heart that is supple and soft. Having heart that is not moved by the exteriors and the qualities of people, but having the heart of God, having that peace having that loving heart, and that's the gift that God gives to us. Peace in the midst of tempest. Peace as we follow the path that Jesus has walked. Jesus loved us. Jesus chose us despite of who we are. If that is the faith confession today for us, the gift is that we can do the same. And it's hard. That's why you must lean on Jesus. You can't do this on your own. You have to be close to him. You have to be at the cross, begging, seeking and knocking and say, I need your heart. If that's Jesus, if you are the representation of true human person, if that's how God has made us to be, if that's what God is revealing to us here today through choosing of the 12 disciples, then I want to be like that. I want to be nothing less than that. So I repented, naturally, and said, whoever comes as the next Mirai pastor, my goal is not that we continue on with good ministries and good fruit, but I learn to love regardless of who you are. Regardless of how you treat me and how, how you treat Bridgeway, that we will continue to love you 
because Jesus loves me regardless of how I treat him. So, the path, the way of cross is clearly laid out before us. Let us love the world in the way that Jesus has loved us. Let us not think that good outcome is the ultimate test and litmus test for who God is. But God, when he leads us down the path of the cross, that he's giving us something good, and that is that we are becoming just like Jesus. The path that Jesus walked on, the path of thorn, Jesus stepped on every thorn himself to break them so that when we walk, that is tolerable. He went before us. He was scarred for us. Jesus prayed for the sinners that we may become just like him in the redemption of our life here, in our home, in our office, in our school, and, and finally in this church. Let us pray together. Father, we pray today that we will follow you to the cross, that you have stepped on the thorny bush and you made the path for us, and that you have broken the thorns, that we may follow you. It seems daunting and scary, but we put our feet right over the place that you have uh, taken the step. God, we thank you for uh, giving us not just good fruit, but the ultimate fruit, and that is to, in our salvation, as we accept you as our Lord and Savior, we become more and more like you as we live our life here. So God, I pray that when the trials come, when the waves grow, that we will choose you rather than good outcome. Let us see the cross and Jesus through the tempest, through the waves, through the rain. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.